Thank you, Karen. Good morning, Heart of Longmont. Good morning. How is everybody today? Good. Well, welcome to the Heart of Longmont, and thank you for coming on this beautiful, so far, day. <laughs> Missouri's weather has just been like this, rainy, rainy, rainy. So anyway, well, we're going to get started with our service today, and we're going to stand and sing, Now is the Time to Worship. Stand if you are able. Cynthia and Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Happy Memorial Day, graduation Sunday. What else is it? it? Whatever it is, it's a wonderful day, and we're glad that you're here. Welcome to the Heart of Longmont Worship. Glad that you're with us. Uh, I know several people are out on trips or attending graduation ceremonies. Uh, maybe you're here for the first time because you've got a long weekend and you're visiting with family. If so, we're so glad that you're here. Going to invite those of you who may be new to worship with us to sign in on one of our welcome cards that you'll find on the pew rack in front of you. The rest of you can sign in on the pew pads as they make their way down each pew and just let us know that you've been here today. Hopefully you've gotten a uh, bulletin and you can see some of the upcoming events and announcements for this coming uh, time. We have uh, uh, the Faith Fest, which is a couple of Saturdays from now, June 8th, going to be over at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. And uh, that's in the afternoon. It's going to be a, a service and celebration. 
would love to have as many of you be there as possible. A lot of different pastors from around the area are going to be participating in this event, and so it should be really good. Uh, today's Native American Ministry Sunday. You're going to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, I, Roger, I'm wondering, did everybody get one of the envelopes that uh, for the Native American Awareness offering in their bulletins today? We may... Uh, we may make sure that uh, the ushers get those out to everybody, okay, for, for folks? Okay, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate that. Well, um, I'm going to invite you now to simply stand and, uh, oh, mingle, okay? Uh, get up and walk around a little bit. Greet people. Welcome them in the name of Christ. Today we are celebrating Native American Ministry Sunday. Did you know that more than 20,000 Native Americans are part of the United Methodist Church? Our offering directly supports Native American congregations, equipping them to minister authentically within their communities while honoring creative expressions of culture and heritage. In the Dakota's annual conference, for example, this offering has supported a culturally appropriate vacation Bible school experience that includes a food pantry and clothing closet and provides job opportunities for Native Americans to lead the camp. Native American-led United Methodist Ministries serve the people who worship on Sunday mornings and expand into the community to respond to trauma among the indigenous people that may be manifested in domestic violence, alcoholism, or suicide. The offering also supports scholarships for Native American students like Reverend Stephanie Escher, who now serves as a hospital chaplain. She's a member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe. The Native American Seminary Award, funded by United Methodist Special Offering, helped her manage the cost of studying for a Master of Divinity degree at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. We have a collective opportunity to live out our commitment with specific action. In our offering of love to God, who first loved us, may our gifts multiply and overflow this world with justice, peace, and love until all are whole. This anthem that we're going to sing is based on words from a poem by the great Amer African American poet Langston Hughes. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. Uh, it's about the dream that infused the building of this country. It's about five pages long, but the gist of it is this. You start with nothing, nothing but your eyes and your hands and the faith that's in your heart and the strength and the will to build. Your eyes see the materials, the difficulties too, and look for the obstacles and how to overcome them. And your hand seeks the tools, 
to use those materials to cut the wood, to till the soil, to harness the waters, and your heart looks for companions and community to help so that it's a shared dream. A long time ago, ships came from across the sea bringing pilgrims and prayer makers, adventurers, free men and slaves to a new world, America. Plowing, planting, harvesting, building, villages, towns, cities, boats, wagons, coaches, farms, factories, markets, and warehouses. And we established a country where we believe all are created equal. And there are dark days and have been dark days and still will be, but there are also ways to overcome them and a, a great, big, beautiful land. So the slaves made up a song that had a, as its theme, uh, keep your hand on the plow, hold on, freedom is coming. So throughout this history of our country, we've shared visions and a hope. And even when democracy is being battered on all sides, there's a vision. America is a dream. So keep your hand on the plow. Hold on.
Jesus and the disciples journey through Judea and come to the city of Jericho. Crowds are everywhere. A voice calls out to Jesus from the crowd. The voice belongs to another of the misfits, outcasts, and loners we have been looking at for the past month. So far, we have seen Jesus interact with a woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years, with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and with a mother who forced Jesus to reconsider his ministry. Today, we hear the story of Bartimaeus. Hear these words from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, and a blind beggar, was sitting at the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he crowd out, cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and called him, Come here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. May God grant us wisdom and courage as we hear these words from Scripture. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Catherine. Wow, I, I'm a Langston Hughes fan. Boy, Soul Singers, that was a great number. Thank you, Karen, for leading that. Um, I'm going to invite you to pray with me now as we enter into our time for the message. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I don't want to assume that everyone here knows what's been going on in our United Methodist denomination lately. Now, many of you do. And uh, so I apologize uh, in advance because some of this may be old news to some of you. But for years, our denomination has had disagreements about whether or not gays, lesbians, transgendered folks can serve in ministry in the United Methodist Church or whether pastors can perform same-sex marriages a special general conference of Methodists from around the world gathered in late February a couple months ago in St. Louis. And there, that group voted to continue to bar homosexuals from being ministers and forbidding pastors from performing those weddings. Needless to say, those decisions didn't sit well with everyone. And so there's been a lot of activity since then to try to figure out what we do next. Uh, last couple of weeks, there have been two important meetings. One was in uh, Minneapolis, a meeting called Our Movement Forward. It was a summit and mainly um, attended by and put on by proponents of what had been called the simple plan that basically removed all restrictions out of our book of discipline related to homosexuality. And so during this meeting a couple weeks ago in Minneapolis, the participants were able to talk about three different possibilities, three different tracks, resisting from within, developing a sort of a hybrid approach of being still very connected or not being connected as a denominational church or birthing an entirely new church connection. And by far the best attended track dealt with creating a new movement. 
A frequent refrain in small group discussions was a desire to have a radically different structure than the current denomination, uh, leaving behind the old church hierarchy with bishops and the clergy appointment system. And then the second big meeting occurred just this past week at the Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. UMC Next was the name of this uh, group, and they were also exploring options. Uh, this was sort of an invitation-only gathering, uh, and so they talked about do we resist from within or do we rebuild from without, and uh, nothing firmly was decided, but they did come up with a four commitments document, and uh, if you'd like a chance to read that document, I'd be happy to share the website with any of you after the service. Uh, Doug Palmer, who has been here several times to talk about the future of the United Methodist Church, was at that particular meeting. And then of the conservatives or the traditionalist folks who who won the vote at that special general conference in February, they've also been busy uh, sort of shoring up their side and planning to bring to the next general conference, which will take place next year. They're going to bring some petitions to make those restrictions even more binding. Now, this isn't a sermon about all of that. All of that is just to say that as a denomination, we're still trying to figure out what the future holds for us. We're still all just sort of stumbling in the dark. Stumbling in the dark. That brings us to our final misfit, outcast, or loner. During this month of May, we've looked at some of the people that Jesus encountered who were often considered misfits or outcasts by the community around them. There was the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, who couldn't even dare to ask Jesus to, to try to heal her, but instead simply just reached out her hand and touched the hem of his garment. There was the short tax collector, Zacchaeus. He and I see eye to eye on so many things. Um, and many of the people in his town had made so many assumptions about Zacchaeus, but Jesus recognized him as a child of God. And then there was the mother who had a daughter who was quite ill, and she actually helped Jesus sort of see that his ministry wasn't just for the Jews, but for all people. And so after taking a break last week for that excellent Youth Sunday service we had, and those of you that were here, wasn't that tremendous? That was just great. Yeah. We've got some fabulous youth, and they're going to be going to Puerto Rico in a couple of weeks for a mission trip. So after taking a break to uh, celebrate them, we return for our final misfit, outcast, and loner a blind man named Bartimaeus. This is the second story in this series to be focused on the town of Jericho. That was where Zacchaeus lived as well. And today Jesus is heading out of Jericho and heading up to Jerusalem. And there on the outskirts of the city sits a blind beggar. And he has a name. And this is pretty unusual because often the people that Jesus heals in the Gospels aren't given a name. But here he is. We are told he is Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And in Mark's Gospel, at least, he is the last person Jesus heals before his crucifixion in Jerusalem. By sitting on the road leading from Jericho to Jerusalem, Bartimaeus can beg for coins from the travelers who go by. He would have had his cloak spread out on the ground in front of him, and people would throw coins onto that cloak, that blanket. And at the end of the day, he'd gather that cloak up, and then he'd use it, the cloak, for a blanket to help cover him. 
And on this particular day, he hears Jesus is coming by. And Jesus' fame has, of course, preceded him. And he, Bartimaeus, begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mark says that many of the people in the crowd sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he got even louder. That sort of sounds like what the disciples tried to do with that Canaanite mother. Quiet her down. Be quiet. Send her away. They told Jesus to tell her to go home. These Jericho crowds are doing the same thing with Bartimaeus. We don't like to have the people who are on the fringes raising their voices and demanding to be heard. Don't they know their place? And we still see this all the time. I meet people who tell me they have nothing against homosexuals, but they just don't want to see them. Don't they know their place? If a minority group begins... Well, isn't it obvious, Jesus? Poor man is blind. He's been reduced to begging for a living. But Jesus is wise here. And I love the way Catherine read that passage of Scripture. What do you want me to do for you? He doesn't treat the man in a condescending way. He doesn't assume that he already knows what's best for him. He doesn't act as if, I've got it all figured out. You just have to listen to me. He doesn't sort of give a pat response and not have to fully engage with him. Just heal him and send him on his way. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He treats Bartimaeus with respect and with dignity as a human being. What do you want me to do for you? I think that's a question we have to ask often. Even as a church, when we try to do good and help others, do we take the time to ask others just what it is they would want from us? Or do we come in with our own notions of what they need, our own agendas of doing good so that we can feel good about being do-gooders? Do we just already assume that we know what they need? Ask. Don't assume. Engage. Treat others like a human being. Bartimaeus says, Teacher, let me see again. And Jesus tells him that his faith has healed him, and Bartimaeus sees and he begins to follow Jesus. And we assume that means all the way to Jerusalem. Perhaps all the way to the cross. Bartimaeus follows. Let me see again. Let me see again. That's a request that so many of us need to make. Often we find we are losing our capacity to see what is really important relationships, this beautiful planet, the humanness and dignity of others. We can get so fixated on one thing that we feel to see the other things that are right in front of us. Let me return to this issue of our United Methodist denomination for a moment again. So much news this past week of the meetings that I just described, the plans, the discussions about what the future holds for us? Can we realize our own blindness so that we can seek to be healed from that blindness? Our denomination seems to be stumbling in the dark, so stuck in tradition that we can't see what our real work now is all about. Blind to new understandings, blind to the needs of others, blind to the ways in which our own privilege keeps us from seeing another perspective. We're hoping, hoping, I am at least, for a larger, generous, and even more inclusive Methodist movement. And that's important. 
but we mustn't lose sight of the other things that are just as important, the other things that we are about. In addition to reporting on these meetings from Minneapolis and Kansas City this week, the United Methodist News Service also reported stories of how our United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, is helping thousands of Oglala Sioux on the Pine Ridge Native American Reservation in South Dakota and helping to deal with the devastation on the reservation, those very poor places who got hit by winter and spring storms and flooding. And so we need to also see that big picture as well. Let us see again. Let us see again truth and beauty, reality, love, respect, grace, peace. May it be so. Let us pray. I know, God, sometimes I can get so single-focused I fail to see the big picture. I get blind to the things that are also right in front of me. Let us see again, Lord. Bring sight to our spiritual hearts. Help us to see needs. Help us to see people as people and not just problems. Help us to see how we might be able to make a difference. Thank you for these stories of these outcasts, these misfits, these loners, and for the lessons their stories teach us. May we continue to grow in our understanding through your grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Join us now as we sing, I am free. Thank goodness we are free.
free to dance, free to run, because of all that God has done for us. In a moment, we're going to uh, collect the offering uh, as a response to what God has done for us, so many things. And uh, after that, we're going to engage in a few moments of prayer. And if you have a particular prayer concern, a celebration, would invite you to fill out one of the prayer request slips that's in the pew rack in front of you and drop that in the collection plate as it comes by. We are free because of all that God has done. Let's receive our tithes and offerings. Thank you, ushers. God, our hearts are grateful. Continue to help us to cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving and appreciation for all that you have done and for the many ways others have ministered to us. Use these gifts now that we offer in gratitude to help provide ministry for many others. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.
several requests for prayer here. And as I share these, I hope you will keep these uh, particular requests firmly in your hearts. Uh, this is from Anna. Graham's brother-in-law, Uncle Ron, fell and has low blood pressure, was in the hospital and asking prayers for his recovery. From Dave Waddell, prayers for Mary Ann, who is in the hospital with a kidney infection. Let her know we're praying for her, please. Kay Marsh uh, asks prayers for our sister Sonia, who has MS and no immunity. She also knows of a woman who's dealing with uh, the results of a sexual assault. And vets who are not whole as a result of their service to our country. Uh, prayers for the Wesley Foundation also at Colorado University. Um, from Tim and Kathy, Kathy's mom Rosalie is getting weaker, refusing food, liquids and meds. Son-in-law KB Hannigan finished six weeks of bladder chemo. And then Kathy's sister Vicky's mental health prayers for improvement there and prayers for safe travel for Tim and Kathy as they head back to Missouri on Tuesday. Uh, from Buddha, please pray for a guy I met named Ted who has Parkinson's brought on by Agent Orange Exposure. He feels suicidal. He feels suicide is the only answer. Prayers for Ted and for all those who are feel suicide is the wrong answer but don't know the right answer. Shirley asks prayers of healing for her brother Bud Sterling who fell and broke his hip. Uh, today also, I guess, happens to be Tim Bradley's birthday. And so somebody named Kathy says, happy birthday to the wonderful man that I married, <laughs> Tim. So happy birthday, Tim. <laughs> yes, today, this weekend, we remember so many who uh, served our country and who gave their lives in the service of our country. Um, we honor them, we respect them, we remember them. And we also pray for the day when others don't have to die, where our world can be at peace. So for these and your own private personal concerns or celebrations, let's come to the Lord in prayer. God, we are humbled as we come before you now. We realize we don't live our lives in isolation. No one is an island. But we live in relationship with each other. We live with the consequences of actions and decisions that others make. We realize we are able to be here today to worship you because of sacrifices that many made. And Lord, we pray for those who are heavy on our hearts, loved ones and perhaps even strangers who are struggling with life, struggling with illness, sickness, depression, suicidal thoughts, who are struggling in relationships, don't know where to turn. We pray for all who are hurting today. And again, Lord, help us to be able to see how we might be vessels of your love and grace to others. And then give us the courage and the will to be able to live out 
that faith to put into action what we say we believe. We remember so many people today. Lord, we pray for a world where your peace reigns, where sacrifices of those who give all in battle no longer has to happen. May that be a true legacy of their gift to us. Lead us and continue to guide us into that future. All these things, Lord, we pray in the name of Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Once again, we come to the Lord's table to share in this meal that Christ invites us to. And uh, we take this invitation seriously, knowing that while it may seem like a small gesture, it has a huge impact in our spiritual life. It binds us together as the body of Christ. It strengthens us in our, our daily walk with God. And so today we're going to share together, and you don't have to be part of this church to come and receive the bread and the juice. Um, you don't have to be part of any church necessarily. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and seek to be at peace with their neighbors. In a few moments, the ushers will invite you to come down the outside uh, aisles, and at each corner there'll be a couple of people with a cup of juice and a piece of bread. You'll be handed a piece of bread, and you can dip it into the cup and partake that way. We also have gluten-free options at both corners as well for those who need that. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took the bread and broke the bread, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God, we thank you for these gifts. Bread, juice, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would bless and consecrate them so that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we can be the body of Christ alive in this world, doing the work of Christ, fed by your Spirit. Make us one with each other and one in ministry with you to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory. And we feast together at that heavenly banquet. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Will those who are going to assist please come now?
Jesus Christ. If you stun him, you already know the love of Jesus. We invite you to come.
Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this mystery. It's a holy mystery in which you give yourself to us, you feed and nourish us, and now that we have received, may we be strengthened to be able to go out into the world to give our lives for others as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're able, I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing our final hymn this morning. Amen, amen. Now, friends, go forth in peace. Go to put more love into the world. Go knowing you are dearly loved children of God. Amen.